So uh, thanks to uh, Gordon for uh, organizing this workshop and thank, uh, thank you all for uh, attending. And I'll be looking forward to the discussion um, afterwards. I prepared, as Gordon was saying there, I prepare, prepared a short uh, presentation just to set the, the ball uh, rolling. But the, the main aim of the workshop today is to give an opportunity for an exchange of uh, ideas. Perhaps some of you have seen me uh, deliver a few online presentations on some of the findings of our Gaelic crisis in the vernacular community publication. And most of the presentations to date have been contextual, uh, trying to contextualize the challenges and the remedial actions uh, that are needed to deal with the level of crisis. Uh, and naturally much of the lively public debate that we've had has uh, focused on the possibility of uh, new policies. But I, I want to do something slightly different. Uh, you'll be aware that some of the debate, the debate has not focused on the actual evidence of the study. So what I intend to do is to focus some attention today in this short presentation on some of the new insights uh, that we have uh, covered uh, in the research project. There are 21 of them in all I'm going to present now, uh, but by no means uh, the 21 new insights I'm presenting today are exhaustive uh, of um, all the insights in this 500 uh, page uh, study. And just before I go on, I have to acknowledge uh, that this uh, publication came out of Seilsh's Island um, Gaelic Research Project, funded out of Seilsh's Research Project Fund, which was sponsored by the um, SFC, HIE, and Borshna Gaelic. So we're very grateful to uh, our sponsors and very grateful to our different supporters in the participating uh, universities in the Seilsh partnership. Also, uh, we have to recognize the role of all the authors. So it was a team effort over many years, and some of the authors are joining us today. Gorshtum Cameron, Padraig Moirach, Ian Kainbull, Brian MacDonald, Dian O'Kurnoin, and Tamash Peter Vari. So I'm speaking on behalf of the team uh, rather than just on behalf of myself. And that's why I'm going to concentrate on the findings uh, of the, the book. You're probably aware also that there is a website accompanying uh, the publication, which is uh, available on the Language Sciences Institute web pages in the UHI. And there are details there of uh, a digest, a research note, and uh, appendices, and we've included some of the media uh, coverage uh, to date. And again, uh, I said this in the previous online presentations, the aim of this Gaelic crisis study was to do an in-depth uh, study of the transmission of Scottish Gaelic as a communal language in the Western Isles, in Staffan, uh, on the Isle of Skye, and in the Isle of Tiree. Uh, in the Earth Island Butte area. So that's the uh, remaining social geography of the vernacular um, community. That is not to say uh, that there are not vernacular speakers in other parts uh, of Scotland. Um, I, I, I'm thinking of Western Ross and the Loch, uh, the Loch Aber area as well, where we have uh, generally they tend to be um, older networks uh, of speakers. But uh, in general, the, the area we've chosen for our study, that encapsulates the socio-geographic socio extent of the uh, vernacular communities. Also, I want to point out some of the underlying, underlining uh, uh, philosophy of the authors. And this theme of interdependence comes up once or twice in the study, uh, that feasible or credible minority language policy it is based on this notion of independence, interdependence, of maintaining existing communities, uh, promoting support contexts for the emergence of learners uh, to form new networks, 
uh, and the integration of efforts to maintain existing communities and um, promoting new networks that should be done in an overall social context of a sympathetic political and official um, intervention. And if you want to read that in more detail, uh, we set out why this cooperative dynamic is so important, this uh, idea of interdependency, and our philosophy is rooted in a functionist materialist approach to the minority language condition in uh, advanced or late capitalism. Um, the, the reason why cooperation is so important is simply because of the marginal demolinguistic aspect of uh, Gaelic um, speakers in, what they, in whatever context they're in, a vernacular context, a learner context, or a, a new network of um, speakers. The, uh, just to show you how we divided up the, uh, the geography of the, the survey, uh, you see here the map of the Western Isles with the area of North Sky and the Isle of Tiree there. And for the purposes of census analysis, this, all the areas were divided up into 25 study districts. And then we have also five survey modules and across the survey modules, and I'll give a little detail on them in a second, uh, we were able to do generational or decadal um, comparisons of different age cohorts, and then to compare various language practice modes uh, across the generations uh, and across uh, time periods. And I'll say a little about that uh, later on as we go ahead. Okay, so the first of the new insights uh, uh, we indicate in the study is this idea of that the Gaelic speaking community uh, becomes more fragmented in the de demo linguistic decline. If you look on the right hand side of the diagram here, we see the standardized incidence ratio. That's a scoring mechanism for every study district. Uh, and we do a cluster analysis of them. And it indicates that we basically have th uh, three types of uh, districts. Uh, this, the Stornoway area and the suburbs, plus a few others. But in general, uh, in 1981, the most of the rural uh, districts uh, conformed to one profile. But moving ahead after uh, three decades of uh, decline, we see we do the same cluster analysis and it, it divides all of the 25 districts into five uh, clusters. So indicating a fragmentation from three to five clusters. Moving on then, the, the second new insight, we were able to quantify the actuality gap. And uh, if you uh, remember from um, Professor Ken McKinnon's voluminous work, he coined this phrase, the actuality gap, the difference between what is depicted in the census and what what is actual in communities, we were able to put a figure on that. And the way we did that was by uh, the, a cluster analysis of the sociogeographic distribution of reported Gaelic ability, plus a comparison of individual data with household ability. Uh, just very quickly, you can, you can see how we get it. This is the correlation line between the household data and the ability data. And the correlation of 45% of individual ability corresponds with 15% uh, household Gaelic use. And we assume at a higher threshold, we see a similar uh, gap between 58% and 25% uh, in the uh, higher range of the data. The, um, one of the reasons we cannot take census data on uh, face value is, uh, is that there are nine possible competence profiles for reported Gaelic ability in the census. And we set them all out there. I don't have time to go through them all, but you see it uh, ranges from a full acquirer of Gaelic to those uh, filling out the Gaelic ability data out of a sense of affiliation with the Gaelic group. And we do a similar exercise then with the profiles of the Gaelic households. And we see that there are 10 uh, possible um, profiles. And this leads us to the next new insight of the study, which we have referred to 
This, this builds on the actuality gap. And we refer to this as the uh, nexus analysis, the nexus between individual data and household data. And again, we do a cluster analysis of this correlation between the two uh, sets of data. And the, the cluster analysis indicates that the 25 study districts fall into three um, clusters. And we refer to these as the residual nexus, the interstitial nexus, and the moribund uh, nexus. I understand the terms here aren't very nice, but the point here is if you take the 15% in the lower part uh, of the nexus, well, you have to divide, divide that then by 10 household profiles. So uh, essentially what we're saying, uh, the areas that fall below this 15% household, 45% reliability, essentially there is very little evidence of vernac the vernacular practice of Gaelic in these uh, communities. Another insight we have here, we were able to quantify the maximal extent of the uh, vernacular group. And you've probably seen this reported in the media that we quantified the maximum uh, extent of the group as 11,000 people. And there are two ways of doing this. Again, from our uh, comparative analysis of individual and household data. And you can see here, as I'm going through, I'm indicating where you can read up further on these in the study. Um, and the comparison of individual and household, that yields 10,882 people. But if you multiply all those who report Gaelic ability, that's a little over 14,000, by the gradient of the linear correlation between the household and the individual data, so, and the, the gradient of the, the line is 0.78, that yields 10,991. So that is a difference of nine people. So I, I think you, we can consider these calculations as fairly robust. Moving on then to the fifth, uh, and this is taking data from the preschooler uh, survey. And we, the, the reported um, preschoolers it, this survey indicated that less than 5% of the preschoolers had acquired an ability in Gaelic from the home environment prior to enrollment in the preschools. Uh, and this is why we were able to uh, state this, that the category of home acquirers of Gaelic is almost defunct now if we take into consideration the profile of the uh, young family um, profile in the Western Isles. Uh, moving on then, uh, again, this is a related issue, uh, again from the reported data on the preschoolers, and what we are seeing here uh, an over-optimistic perception uh, of the social presence of Gaelic in these communities. We asked the, the directors and teachers and the preschoolers to assess um, the perceived percentage of Gaelic speaking children over the last 10 year period. Uh, interestingly, they generally correspond with the reported data in the census, but they don't correspond with the lower level of 5% that is reported now. Obviously there, there is a time period of 10, uh, 10 years. So maybe the, either the decline happened over the 10 year period, or it is a uh, an overly optimistic portrayal of the reality of Gaelic in these communities, or it is, it's reflecting what has been reported in the census. We're back to the actuality gap issue there. Moving on then, and this is, you'll see here from the figuring of the, of the uh, table 4, 14. So that's from the uh, chapter four, the teenager chapter. And we were seeing the uh, correspondence between Parental, uh, parental input and the language ability scores for the teenagers. And the interesting point here that the most salient, the most important form of in input uh, for uh, Gaelic ability is the parental input. For example, if we compare the teenagers who had to rely on the school system only to acquire their Gaelic or who had to rely on grandparental input, 
we see that they are much lower scores. Uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, grandparental input is only slightly better from the schooling uh, input. Moving on then, the eighth new insight, and this is an identity issue, and we see here, this is a comparison between Gaelic ability scores again, and those identifying as a Gael, and we see that those who identify as a Gael tend to have a higher score in uh, Gaelic ability. So uh, group identification and ability seem to correspond. The ninth new insight, this, uh, this is the point I made initially that we were able to compare data across modules. So the standardized incidence ratio, that's a scoring system for every uh, study district. And we compare that with the teenagers who identify as the Goyle. And we see that there is a strong correlation between that. In other words, the more the young teenagers identify as Goyle, the stronger, the likelihood that you're going to have a stronger standard incident ratio is higher. Now, the 10th uh, new insight, um, and what we're doing here is we're drawing from uh, results in many of uh, the surveys, and we're comparing data from the oldest age cohort, uh, so those born prior to 1951, with the youngest age cohort, so in other words, the preschoolers. And we compare across these age cohorts, Gaelic practice on a scale from Gaelic only to English only. And the point here is that there is a mixed mode of language practice in the intervening period from the move from Gaelic dominance now to English dominance uh, in these communities. But the distribution of the data here um, would, in over time, would indicate that the intervening uh, mixed mode of language practice, in other words, some Gaelic, some English, uh, is transitory. A related issue, uh, again, this is drawing results from many parts of the, uh, the, the modules. Uh, we see here the XY curve of the 60 year time span of the language shift. So when we, what we call here the total Gaelic scores and the total English scores, that's dividing up the scales of practice. Uh, you can see quite clearly here, we go back to those born prior to 1951, the dominance of Gaelic in these communities. And now we go to the preschoolers practice with their own peers. In other words, preschooler use, and we see the mirror image dominance of English, uh, though. So in other words, this indicates the completion of the language shift in these communities over this 60 year uh, period. Probably one that's uh, uh, visually uh, more readily uh, understandable uh, is the diffusion of ability levels over a time period. You can see here, if you look at the, um, this is from chapter six in the book. If you look at the pensioner age cohort, uh, you see a much more solid block of those reporting fluid, fluent speaker ability in Gaelic. And as we descend through the age groups, it becomes much more uh, diffuse uh, in the younger age cohorts. The, uh, the next, uh, New insight number 13, uh, this, is, this is taken from chapter six, and we're seeing here a bimodal spectrum of uh, language ability. Again, this is based on comparisons of different uh, age, the, those older than 45 and those younger than 45. And this would indicate that either, mostly people have fluent Gaelic or they have little Gaelic. So in other, this, the bimodal spectrum of ability tends to be either fluent Gaelic or fluent English. Moving on then, an, a, uh, another um, a timeline approach uh, of Gaelic fluency scores. Um, and what we're seeing here is we're, that we're able to pinpoint the turning point the sociolinguistic turning point in the vernacular area. 
And if you go to those between 35 and 44, in other words, those born in the 70s, you can see the fairly rapid uh, drop in all the data lines, those of local origin, other areas in the Western Isles, um, and in comparison with other, those from other areas. Um, the census data tended to indicate that the sociolinguistic turning point was in the, in the 80s, but our, mod, our, our data from the module, modules indicates that the turning point was in the 70s. Moving ahead to a new insight number 15, uh, what we're seeing here, again, this is a comparison from uh, chapter two, the census data, the scoring system for the uh, study districts, the standardized incident ratio. And again, there is a strong correlation between both parents of the teenagers being reported as being fluent Gaelic speakers and the stronger incident incidence ratio. In other words, stronger levels of ability in the areas in general. Moving ahead then to the uh, policy aspect uh, of the study, and you'll be aware that we conducted uh, consultations, uh, focus groups, and public meetings uh, to gauge uh, opinion and to give an opportunity for discussion uh, on the issues. And the main finding there uh, are the findings are the weak relevance of the current strategic initiatives for the vernacular group and the weak effectiveness or lack of equity in resource allocation, particularly in the vernacular context. Uh, the 17th uh, insight, uh, we identified this issue of the problem basically of having language promotion when the minority language group is in decline. And that is manifested as language promotion without sufficient language uh, pr protection. And as we stated here, the, uh, therefore, the national plans for Gaelic with their primary focus on status planning meet a symbolic need to assert the civic presence of Gaelic in Scotland without creating the official capacity or mechanisms to influence behavioral change at the vernacular uh, level. Uh, and Leading on from that, in other words, if we stick with the status quo, insight number, uh, new insight number 18, we're uh, continuing along the trajectory with the current policy dispensation where we uh, posit this uh, prognosis uh, in different realms of geography, socialization, normativity, mode of acquisition, and the level of uh, linguistic function. Essentially, what we're saying there is that we're moving into a post-geographic, post-vernacular uh, situation for Gaelic promotion. Uh, the 19th issue, uh, and this comes up uh, initially in the book, and we return to it in the final chapters, of this issue of the need for comprehensiveness in minority uh, language um, planning and uh, policy. And the main uh, feature of this is that, I'll read it out, comprehensiveness, among other requirements, refers to social context where the primacy of the minority language is productive and normative and where the majority language is not included. In other words, creating the space for the normativity of the language that is under threat. Then the the new model that we're suggesting, again, this is a new insight. Uh, it's a community development model for a vernacular community in crisis that is based on a, a cooperative participatory model. And there are six stages in its implementation. And uh, in stages five and six, they indicate the focus. In other words, how you make the policy real for the remaining members of the vernacular community. And I'll finish on this one. The uh, last new insight is we come up with a mechanism by which the uh, vernacular approach, in other words, you address the crisis of the vernacular community and you integrate this with the existing civic national perspective of minority uh, language planning. 
uh, that is suggested in chapter nine of the book. The issue here is if the existing dispensation, the policy framework for Gaelic, cannot address the vernacular crisis uh, in the islands, well, that will change the relationship that the remaining vernacular communities have with Gaelic um, officialdom. So I'll finish up there. There are, there are, as I said earlier, that's 21 new insights into the Gaelic vernacular um, condition and uh, by no means exhaust, exhaustive. Um, but uh, the important point now is if we are going to make progress on these issues, that the discussion would be evidence-based uh, as we have called for in this publication. So uh, thank you for listening and I'll hand back to Gordon at this stage. Thank you.